started. Hello, hello, everybody. I am moving all of our panelists over right now, and we are about to get started. There we go. Everyone is here. So good evening, everybody. I know we are getting started here right on time. Uh, I don't know everyone's time is precious. Um, so I'm going to introduce myself, the obvious reason why we're all here. And then I'm going to go around and call on our very illustrious panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, please feel free to, again, say your name, where you are, and maybe one cool thing about your program or site, whichever one you'd like to go with. Um, and then we will jump right in and I will introduce how we will get today started for the evening. So my name is Dr. Lovanani. I do emergency medicine, which is like this much psych in it, um, but I will be your moderator for today. I am the PBM to the EC for Estin de Maine. Um, I also work with the Toy for Diversity, hence my very lovely polo. Um, and I am here to just facilitate the flow. Um, psychiatry is booming in my opinion right now. And having a session for the road to residency is extremely important. So I will say thank you now and probably a million more times to our panelists before the end of the evening. So I'm going to go as it looks on my screen, uh, which is to Dr. Ebueli, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hello, can you guys hear me okay? Hi. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Ebueli. I'm one of the associate program directors for our residency program at The Ohio State University College of Medicine um, Psychiatry Residency Program in Columbus, Ohio. Um, one of the, what was that, cool things about our programs? Ooh, there is so many. Um, uh, we have one of the largest class um, classes in the country. Um, and so with that, we have a lot of resources um, for residents to really kind of like flesh out their, you know, personal take and, you know, different interests, um, whether they have residents that have while they're in training with us, have gotten their like MPH, they've gotten their master's in education along, um, and we have opportunities for different exposures in so many fields, whether it's rural, forensics, community, um, as well as different areas of research and academia. Well, that's pretty awesome. Um, and this is the season to say the Ohio State many, many times between now and January. So we'll continue on. Uh, Dr. Hairston, you're next on my counterclockwise circle. Hello, everybody. I am Dr. Danielle Harrison, or Dr. Name Danny on the socials. I am the residency training director at the Howard University, um, HU, you know, and um, I also love as my classmate. So that is how he got me to uh, come over here, even though I love to do this for SNMA every year. Um, and interesting things about my program. I mean, my program is great it's in dc is 101 degrees today uh apparently but i do not have an apd currently so my residents are really like the standing acting apd so in my program the residents have a lot of input and give me a lot of good ideas um so we really work together and it's a small program i wish it was as big as at the Ohio State, but we are a smaller program, so we're a pretty tight-knit together, um, close program. We got to find you some FTEs for an APD real quick. We do. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Strange, last but certainly not least, please go ahead. Hi, my name is Dr. Maya Strange. I'm uh, the program director for the Child Adolescent Psychiatry Fellowship at the University of uh, Vermont. And, um, and I guess I'd say one of the cool things. So I'm I'm here as a, a fellowship director, but we also have an integrated child track. So we have um, five residents uh, per class in the residency, and two of those spots are dedicated for people who are interested in fast tracking to child adolescent psychiatry. So completing their training in in three years of adult training and two years of child adolescent psychiatry instead of the four years of adult psychiatry followed by a two year fellowship. Um, and we. Um, do a, a real family-based approach with the idea that um, mental health is crucial to all health and um, and that the, the family system is one of the biggest environmental factors. And so to look at the, the family and system surrounding um, youth and, and not just who the person who may be the identified patient to come in and, and with the idea to just fix them. So that is a very important thing to do. Uh, 
everyone's mind is built off of other people's minds. So definitely including the full family, full consortium, I think is a very good practice. I mean, again, I'm not psych at all. Uh, so one of the things that's very important here is all of us on your screen right now already have medical degrees. We know you guys are about to get your medical degrees on the other side. We want to make sure that you not only get your degrees, that you get into the programs you want to get to, and you have the careers that you want to get to. So we can sit up here and spout about specialties all day long, but answering your questions is key. So I can't believe I'm saying this, but it's true. Um, there are more attendees right here than in my EM panel. So I know y'all are going to come with the questions because we had a ton there. So I want you guys to start dropping your questions in the Q&A chat um, or you can use the regular chat, whichever one I'm looking at both of them. I promise you, we will answer them live. We are not scared. We are here for you. Um, and this is a new season. I'm going to throw a test question out there right now to everyone here in academic medicine um, as people start to type on their phones or devices, and then we'll start getting to the student questions. So my question to the panel, um, whoever wants to go first, with the new changes to the ERAS application, what's one of the new changes you're looking forward to the most? Is it reading a lot less experiences? Is it having the experiences getting asterisk? Is it the signaling? What are you guys looking forward to? <laughs> you got to look forward to something. You got to answer them. Um. Well, last year I messed up on the signaling thing as a program director. I didn't really include I didn't elect to participate. And I said that in the panel last year. So um, I'm going to actually do the right thing and make sure that I do get into signaling. But I think the thing that I look forward to, to the most in the last couple of years is that it's virtual and that people really have the opportunity to interview from anywhere. Because there was a big, you know, there could be barriers to traveling. Like if you, especially for, I rarely would have West Coast um, applicants because it would be a lot to get over to the East Coast. So I appreciate that we can now do a lot of things virtually and as well as having like virtual open houses. So it takes off a, a lot of the burden for the applicant so that's probably still remains like I'm even if everybody else goes back to in-person interviews I'm still gonna hold on to virtual I like it to our other panelists um I probably would say the signaling uh, I think like when it was kind of first launched we weren't sure what to do with it um but I think you know, with the interviews being virtual, there's been just more applications and more opportunities and access for um, for applicants to apply to different programs that they might not have otherwise. And so the signaling really allows us to kind of like narrow down those people who um, really have a like vested interest in our program. And so yeah, I'm looking forward to that. And Dr. Strange, anything you're looking forward to or should I dive into these Q and A's? Um, I don't have too much to add other than it's the signaling piece, um, just as people apply to more and more programs and um, having uh, places be more accessible with virtual interviewing, I, I think in addition to other factors has contributed to people applying to more and more. So I think it, it is helpful to see who is truly interested versus kind of who's covering their bases, especially for us as a program where we may, you know, be you know, kind of a little bit off of maybe not immediately on, on everyone's radar. So, but happy to answer other questions. Thank you. So let's dive in. The first one, uh, they call this in uh, Hollywood a segue. Um, since we're talking about signaling, the first question up here is how are you approaching signaling at your specific program? And this person's anonymous who asked this. So I'm going to add a little spice to their question because again, these are students. They want the real. Um, how are your programs approaching it? Um, I'm assuming they're meeting. Do all your signals get free interviews? Uh, are you going to interview the top 50% of your signals? Um, the signaling, is it going to impact the ranking process, even though ERAS says it's not supposed to? Um, so yes, how are your programs now going to approach the signaling process specifically so people know the real deal? Okay, well, like I said, I missed signaling last year, so um, this will be my first time paying attention, but I think the approach will be, for me, it might draw my attention to looking at your application, but if there's nothing that seems like you would fit my program, I don't know if that would guarantee that you would have an interview, so it would make me actually go and look at your application, however, it's not going to guarantee your 
getting an interview because um, there are specifics that I'm looking for. Like we have a serve a very specific patient population. Um, it's a uh, under-resourced community that we serve. So I need to see that you still have that drive. Even if you think you would love to come to DC, we got other programs there in the DC DMV area. Like, so um, it has to be something, but it will draw my attention to looking at your um, application. And I'm not sure how they could say it shouldn't impact ranking because like if you signaled I might be like yeah 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 they they really wanted to come or but I will say my last thing on that is that if you are a Howard student you don't need to signal me like you could just come and talk to me <laughs> so because I don't watch, want you to waste your signals not that you're wasting it but I don't want to, you to use up your signal on me on my program when I could just see you in the hallway and you can just tell me like I really want to come here so that you can still keep your other I don't know why you would have others but you can still keep your others tops um informed as well big facts being dropped here guys to our other panelists it, illuminate the students yeah so it didn't sway the our application process so like we looked through every application and then the signaling was like a second thing that you know like a second level but if it's through the first phase is whether we decide like if this is someone that we want to like interview or not and that's just kind of the application um I think like when we start like narrowing down you know for rank list you know it might it might impact one way or the other and say like, oh, well, this person really signaled and like, you know, has like, you know, it's really shown that they want to be here. Um, but it really, the first phase, which is kind of like getting your foot in the door, it wasn't, it didn't impact it at all for us. Mm. Interesting. Dr. Strange? And, and for us, I would say um, it probably most affects that initial reviewing of the application. It, it doesn't necessarily guarantee an interview, um, but I think that it makes us um, more likely to take a closer look. And then, but once those interviews happen, um, the I think the signaling is less re relevant. It's something that we may still take note of, but it's something that doesn't necessarily affect um, you know, that doesn't necessarily affect how we ultimately do our, our rank list. So we really then at that point try to think about who we really feel, you know, we have what, you know, the best to offer the the candidate as well as, um, you know, as well as the candidate having skills and aptitudes to, to, to bring to us. So um, that I think kind of fades a bit once further along in the application process and in interview process. Great points. Thank you. Uh, the next question I would like to ask is actually a good one, especially since Dr. Harrison mentioned that, you know, we're keeping things virtual for a while. Do programs notice if students attend open houses and what are the benefits of attending them, right? So there's a lot of um, online ones, virtual ones. Like right now, I can see the attendees in the chat, but I'm not taking a picture of all of them. I'm going to email them to you guys. So when you guys host your own open houses, how do you guys treat the attendees there? What are the benefits and pros and cons, should I say? And we can start with anybody. So this this has been somewhat um, controversial within our graduate medical education overall at our institution. And there are some specialties that have actually come out very strongly against um, these open houses or second looks. Um, so, I, uh, so I think as an institution, um, we are starting a pilot program where we may have an overall graduate medical education kind of open house and second look. And um, and I think for psychiatry, we are considering doing one, but essentially after we've submitted our rank lists. So, but but during that window before um, applicants have to finalize and submit theirs, so that um, so that it does not have any bearing on how we rank um, folks, and and even for program directors or those who may have. Um, kind of decision making abilities about how the rank list goes. We are not supposed to know who attends or does not attend, so it doesn't it doesn't sway us um, one way or the other. That's actually a really nice and uh, equitable way of thinking about it. Uh, to our other panelists, uh, I will say that I 
not necessarily keep track. Like it doesn't mean you're going to get an interview, but if I see the name, like I'm just a human. So the name might be like quick in my head. And especially if people email me after the open house and they're like, I was at the open house and I really like this. And that makes me one, not email you back because I have a lot of emails, but it makes me actually look at your um application. So like, if you're like, Oh, I attended your open um, house, which I can just say ours on September 18th at 8 p.m. EST. Um, <laughs> the residents just decided this today, so they just posted about it um, because they wanted to do it. They felt like that would be a way um, to showcase our program, especially because our website is not looking um, too great right now. So I still feel like it's a good way to um, really publicize what we're like. So it does make me, again, like, oh, okay, if you reached out, if you attended, and then you emailed me, then I will try to look at your applications when they when they open up. Again, it doesn't mean that you're going to get an interview because I'm looking for very specific things, but it will make me um, at least look at your application if the, if the name is familiar and like rings a bell. That is excellent. Putting those resident APDs to work. <laughs> And so, so likewise, like uh, Dr. Hurston was saying, um, for us, the open houses are is also an opportunity for the attendees to interact and interface with our residents. And so, sometimes we have our residents there, uh, and so we usually do a, the beginning part where we did our do our presentation for our program, and then you know answer any questions, and then we actually leave and let the residents like interface with, with the attendees. And so it, we just think it's a more personal, just another opportunity to get in front of people so that when your application comes through, again, not a guarantee of an interview, but at least it will be a familiar like name that we know. And so, yeah. So I think it's a positive to attend the virtual open house. This is why the students join this session. They're getting all of the great points here. And this is actually a question I would love to answer you guys to answer, and I would like to know as a mentor as well. Given that applicants waive rights to letters of rec, there is a standard letter of rec being piloted slash suggested by some programs. How will you view that letter versus the traditional letter? And I'm shocked to think when it comes to letter of rec, anything would be standardized. Like that should be to the student. So have you guys heard of this? And what are your thoughts on it? Because that is brand new to me. Everyone's like, no. <laughs> I mean, I, we've I've, I've seen the template and the the standardized, but um, I think it's challenging. And and the program director for for the residency and I have talked about how um, to actually include all of that information. Someone would have to know that person really, really well. Um, and we also had some concerns or reservations because part of that standardized um, template it also includes I forget it's, it's something about like potential areas for growth or, you know, putting some constructive pieces in there. And I think having some concerns about how that may be, how that may be read or, or perceived. And I think, yes, a reluctance to really do that because, um, so I, I don't know how broadly it's going to be, how people are going to use it because it does turn into, even though it says, you know, to keep each section pretty brief, it has potential to become pretty lengthy. Um, I don't think that there's going to really be a difference though for people who use that pilot template versus versus not. Oh, interesting. Are, are the panelists? Um, I didn't know about this um template, but I, I don't know. I don't think, I think this is a time for you to make your students shine. So I don't think there should be any type of negative or anything that could be perceived as negative in a student's letter and if there is then you shouldn't be writing the letter for them you should just be like I can't write a letter for you like I'm not able to do that and um people have to say that so I don't think that's a good idea for me for letters um they're not as high on my list of things that I look at like I really look at M MSPEs to see what they're saying about you like the what's going on like how you did on your site clerkship, how you did um, working with others, like things like that. And then letters I look at to see like, oh, 
because most of the people I don't know. So, you know, if it's someone that I know, like, I'm like, oh, Dr. Strange wrote your letter. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Um, Let me look at this. Or if it's someone, you know, a chair or something like that, then I'm like, oh, okay. Well, maybe they do know you well. Um, But letters, because some letters are really bad. Um, I'm just being honest. Like some letters are like four sentences, double space. And I'm like, why did you even send this? um and the student doesn't even know but that would not exclude me from interviewing them um but we shouldn't have anything that like says anything that could be perceived as negative so I don't know about this four, not four double spaced wow other PDs y'all are with me right like you think <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. so actually on the heels of that I wonder if that was part of the reason why the template was created to you know, to act as a guidance. It's not a great template, but I think like sometimes, because I wonder, right? Because like this, the students have to waive their rights to like view the letter. And so they might approach someone that they think, oh, it's going to be a great letter of, you know, writer. And um, the person just has the four words or the four sentences. Um, like they're great, thumbs up, you know? And I wonder if the template was to like have as a guidance, like these are, you know, these are talking points and, you know, things that you want to be able to highlight in the applicants. I don't agree with the concern part. Like that's not a feedback session, you know, so, um, but, you know, just what are their research or what are their, you know, like what, what did you see? What are their professional attributes? Right. So, um, so I wonder if that was what it was intended for originally, but, um, yeah, we're not, we're not endorsing the template and, you know, we're not like recommending it as like what others use, but yeah. Good. You guys make me happy to know I'm not crazy as a mentor that I would tell someone to dodge a templated letter. Um, Our next question, which, you know, students always want the secret sauce. So you don't have to tell them all the ingredients for your program right here. But the question up is, can you all speak to the attributes that you'd like to see in applicants at your program in Ohio, in DC, in Vermont. Um, again, the list is probably super long, um, but you know, two or three things that can make someone on the other side of that screen feel good about themselves and the applicant they're about to submit to your programs or application they're about to submit to your programs. So I can say, um, I'm not going to say all the things so I want I want to receive a genuine applications, but um, firstly, I'm looking that you actually had an interest in psychiatry, like, um, were you involved in PSIG, were you, or whatever your student psych like, interest group is called, but ours is called PSIG, um, were you involved in the APA, did you go to any conferences, did you go to the BPA, like, did you um do anything that shows me you actually wanted to do psych and it's not just um a backup in case you don't get enough interviews in another specialty um so I'm looking for that and then I'm also I also take long just so you know I take long getting um my invitations out because I actually look at your personal statements and I look for something that shows that you would be a good fit for Howard whether that's understanding systemic racism understanding disparities understanding health inequities um understanding that people don't have insurance understanding um the challenges understanding the carceral system, like there has to be some type of understanding because I need you to, on your darkest day, on that last 15 minutes of your call, to still have some empathy for the patient population that you're serving. And um, yeah, that's all I got for it. That's my Howard homie right there. So are other panelists, anything people should know when they're submitting to Vermont, submitting to the Ohio State? <laughs> Oh, so for the Ohio State University, sorry, I just had to say it. Um, but <laughs> one of the things, you know, again, echo a lot of the things that Dr. Harrison said. Um, I, I reread the personal statement. I, sh I sure do because it gives me a good picture of like what the person is coming in for. Um, if I can give them a little just a little advice about just the interview process, like 
don't have your cat with you or your pet of choice with you. Um, make sure there's nothing questionable in your background um, that would make me question your state of mind. Um, and so things like that, right? Just like try and find a place that would be able to allow you to demonstrate your best professional ability and put your best face forward. Uh, in terms of the type of person, um, I would say one would be humble, <laughs> you know, um, you know, it's, you, you don't know everything and that is actually a strength in that you don't know everything because there's just so much more, like you have that curiosity um, and you, people come from all different walks of life. If you're not able to walk with them and meet with them where they are, you're gonna have a really challenging time in the field of psychiatry, period. Uh, and so, so those are the things that we look for. And then accountability. Um, there is this kind of culture shift that's happening where it's like, I clock out at 5 p.m. or 5.01 on the dot and patient care doesn't necessarily stop at 5 p.m. And so that ability to just recognize that and recognize the limitations, but also what your responsibilities are um, and just like that maturity and emotional intelligence. So. I like that. Dr. Strange, what do I need to put on my application to get down to Vermont? Um, so I, I agree with, with with many of those things about um, account, accountability, um, an ability to self-reflect, um, having cultural humility. I think we also look for evidence of, of a variety of lived experiences. And so, um, so people who may be able to understand that they may be working in systems and with people who um, may have had very different experiences um, from their own. And so um, how to be able to um, navigate that and um, and be helpful and not harmful in those in, in those settings. Um, I think curiosity and, 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 and a genuine interest in, in psychiatry um, and evidence of being able to work well in a team and with others as well. So, so everyone's aware I often have or with sessions like this with Tor for Diversity, SNMA, and LMSA, there are constantly other mentors learning, like I'm learning right now. And I just got a message on the side that said, this is not a clock out job in three exclamation points. So students really take hold of that. Um, yes. Um, I would like to combine our next two questions because listing all those organizations again, um, we have students that we fight for tooth and nail. And we know that sometimes life wasn't easy for us and life wasn't easy for them. I tell everybody all the time, I did not pass step one on my first try, yet I'm still here. Um, so that is one of the questions I like to combine is, how do your programs view board failures? And if you can combine that into what are some red flags that often eliminate an applicant from getting an interview? I know the generic answer is nothing, but if someone wrote a personal statement, I am a serial killer, I'm thinking that eliminate them. So anything you guys can think of that people should either clean up or explain um, that would be red flags on their application. Um, I would recommend that, especially if you did not pass any of the steps, just get ahead of it and explain that, right? Um, you know, whether it's part of your personal statement, because failure is a part of life. <laughs> Without failure, we cannot progress, right? So, um, you know, what I am interested in is in the story, that journey that happened from, you know, you failed it the first time and then you made the changes in your life and, you know, in your studies, um, habits, and then you pass it the second time, right? Like that to me speaks of like perseverance and the person that like, you know, when life is going to knock them down, they have that grit, whatever, you know, terminology we use these days to like get back up. Right. And so, I'm interested in the story and what that transformation looked like more than like the actual numbers. And so what tends to be a red flag for me is when someone tries to like minimize that or kind of like gloss over it. And then it makes me like, wait, did we not recognize, you know, like, again, is this a person that can self-reflect, right? Is this a person that has that emotional intelligence, right? So, I like that. Dr. Harrison, Dr. Strange. I definitely agree. Um, and 
Uh, filling your board does not exclude you from interviewing at my program because I also did not pass that one on my first attempt. And for me to do that, that would be just ridiculous and egregious. Um, and I did not pass that one on my first attempt. And I, there are not too many psychiatrists who are better than this one out here. So, I mean... I mean, I, I, of course, the ones here and the other PD extraordinaires on my um in my crew, but yeah, step one doesn't determine who's going to be um able to relate to their patients, who's going to provide the best service, who's going to be doing the work, and it's not going to be talking about oh, I have to leave at one thirty one to go see my cat, like all types of stuff that people say. So I have residents who have had to take steps more than once. I also have <laughs> residents who have killed step one um, and step two. Um, so I think the red flag for me, though, is lies. Oh, that's my baby. I'm sorry. My baby's out here acting, Go ahead. Go ahead. screaming um, and getting in trouble, I guess, with her dad. Uh, so um, lies, though, like if you put on your... No. If you put on your, if you put on your evaluate, you know, on your ERAS that um, you have no disciplinary actions or you have no. That's real life. You have no disciplinary actions or like you have didn't have any issues or didn't repeat anything. And then I look at your MSPE and it's very clear that you did. Um, no, I'm not interviewing you because that tells me something about. Um, your character and your ethics when you could have just easily explained it like you could have easily said um like um dr belly said you could have at least easily explained it like got ahead of it but instead you choose not to tell the truth then i'm not interviewing you and i'm not gonna say anything about it you're just not gonna hear anything well also we've had someone who like said they were an author on a paper and that's something you can like easily google and then your name isn't on there so just don't lie for me at Howard. lying to a psychiatrist got to be like top three craziest things for someone to do but okay uh dr strange say so, yes i would also say that um failing um uh, one of the steps of boards is, is not a deal breaker or a red flag, or even, um, you know, we sometimes may see people who need to re remediate um, certain courses, especially in, in um, the preclinical years. And, you know, we recognize that some people may need to learn just a different strategy of learning information or studying and, and to see that, and I think to see that process. So if people are able to, I agree with the getting ahead of it and kind of what you learn from it and what you've been able to take from that experience to move forward is really important. Um, kind of the red flags that come up for us or the ones that have come up for me is, um, you know, on the MSP, when I when there are matters that come up around professionalism, especially if they're egregious and if someone had to take a leave of absence, for example, because there were some concerns around professionalism, just leaves, leaves, leaves of absence for other reasons that there may be a whole host of other reasons that generally are not a red flag, but if, if something, if, if something like that is highlighted in that letter, like it's usually those kinds of things that that raise um, some level of concern. Those are all great points. Um, this is an interesting question. And uh, I know for some programs, it's an urban myth. And for other programs, it's not a, an urban myth. Are there filters out there? Screens that if someone doesn't have this, they're not getting through. Um, I know back when me and Danny were roaming the halls at Howard, you know, Oh, if you didn't have a 230, you bet not apply to ortho. Like, you know, there's a screen out there or something like that. Does that exist at your programs? You don't have to say what they are if you don't want to. Um, but if they exist, uh, can you speak on them even a little bit? And this person put some examples. Um, step scores was one of them. Scored versus not scored, even though I think everyone's non-scored for step one now. Uh, so they were joking what their permanent address is. Um, and then another person to combine two questions says, do I even need step two to be taken to get an interview at your program? Um, so if we can combine those two questions and please take your time to think if you have to. So um, filters for my program are like beneficial. So 
if you went to an HBCU, I created my own filter and I have an HBCU filter. So I'm going to see, I'm going to filter like whether it's undergrad or medical school or post back. If you did something at um, an HBCU, then I have a filter for that because I know that you're about this HBCU life and that you can survive here, but not all my <laughs> residents are from an HBCU. I just want to be um, very clear on that. And then you do not have to have taken step two to get an interview, but you have to have taken step two for me to rank you um, at my program. And it's not going to prevent you, but if you have had those um, multiple attempts on step one and you didn't pass, then it does benefit you, not just for my program, but for all programs to get your step two in early, which is what I did myself like I took my step to early on so by the time ERAS opened up I could be like yes I had that problem with step one but boom did you see this I have killed this step two score out here um so that those are the only things that I filter out great and the others that I filter those in we, we know what you meant and I like those filters you know for me uh not that I am applying to site but I still like them any other uh, tidbits the students should know about filters or if step two is needed to get an interview at your program? Uh, step two is not needed for an interview, but um, like Dr. Harrison said, it is needed to um, to then be able to ultimately rank um, someone. And, um, and we do have filters and it generally is not to weed people out, but to, um, to select people. And, um, you know, so, we, we might see, for example, do they mention anything about rural, you know, here, or do they mention anything about Vermont or the area, or there's, you know, there's some of those kinds of filters that we may, um, that we may look at. Yeah, just like the, um, Dr. Strange and Dr. Harrison have mentioned, um, you don't need the step two for the interview, but again, especially if you struggle with step one, it's beneficial to get the step two in um, earlier than later. Um, I was just trying to think like, you know, we might filter like like couple match in, um, you know, so that if people are, you know, looking into other programs, we can see if other programs have interest in them as well. But, um, but yeah, it's, there is nothing, I, there's nothing that I can think of that would filter people out necessarily. I mean, I guess if you have like a felony, but I just, I, yeah. And I, um, I see this question over here, look, um, mm -hmm. Dr. Cool. Nani, so about step three. Um, so step three makes you more attractive to me if you have been out of school for a couple years. So if you've been out of medical school, you've been doing other things, if you're an IMG, you should be taking step three so that I, you are not high risk because at my program, well, at Howard, not my program, that's the GME rule. You have to have passed step three within your first 18 months. So if you've already passed step three, I can say when I'm meeting, you know, um, that yes, look, they've been out, but they killed this step three. I don't even have to worry about it when I get here. I can teach you the psychiatry. You can learn that when you get here. So uh, step three does make you a more uh, attractive applicant at Howard for that specific reason. Uh, different programs have different, like it might be two years or it might be by the end of the program, but I'm seeing some of them is just one year you have to take step three within 12 months and so ours is 18. So I think it's helpful no matter what program you're in. That is a great point. And it answered a question. So thank you. Uh, one of the questions, and it's kind of been hinted at around, well, I'll say, I'll ask, I'll say one thing that's coming up and then I'll ask the question. Uh, coming up at 6.50, um, because there's questions here and we'll make sure we answer them. I will read one question and we'll get one answer just to rapid fire to make sure we knock them all out. Um, but this question I do want all three to weigh in on because I'm assuming, hint, hint, the students will put this in their personal statements or when they sit down and interview with people. What makes a good residence? You know, we heard don't clock out at 501. 
that sounds like a really good thing to me. Um, care about the community you're working in, but what else makes a good residence? You know, should they be able to throw in an art line from across the room that may be very EM-ish? Um, but you know, what do you guys look for that makes a good resident? And I'm sure art lines in sight is probably very frowned upon outside of your intern year, but other times. Come on now. I know y'all got residents. Well, just name some of the good ones. So they, name what they do. <laughs> you don't have to. Some of them have to be good in the program. Do they bring you lunch every day? You know what makes them what makes them good? Um, I would say the ones that actually um are invested in their education, invested in also teaching the medical students, because obviously we are a teaching institutions so ones who actually like include the medical students don't just act like they're not there um who actually show a commitment to the community whether that's like oh I, like if I need volunteers like can anyone go to this health fair with me like oh yes I'll be able to do that um those who like really take a uh total encompassing approach and also those who um don't act very like overly entitled because I'm a I'm a program director who like cares about wellness so when you start like pushing back on me like putting your phone on do not disturb <laughs> during your working hours like what are y'all doing um so just people who back to what we said earlier like accountability I'm high uh like I'm big, big on accountability and the lack of accountability can be rampant in training sometimes. So like just being accountable and knowing that if you make a mistake, okay, but actually um, trying to improve upon that. D&D &D at one o'clock on a Tuesday. That's wild. Be surprised. Yeah. Um, and on the heels of that, I would say being a lifelong learner, you know, um, and having that intentional curiosity Right. And so like, I want someone that like, you know, so why did this happen to the patient? Oh, right. Like, like I want to know more. Right. And so that's, I want to know more to better myself. I want to know more to like understand my patients better to provide better, like quality of care um, and, and goes about it in a way that is respectful you know, both to patients, staff, families, and um, their attendants, so, and their colleagues as well. Excellent. And Dr. Strange, if you'd like to say what makes a good resident and a good fellow, because I think some people out here probably do want to go to fellowship. So yes, I would I would echo the, the curiosity piece um, and um, humility and, and interest for ongoing learning. We, we, you know, we sometimes get people who are very, very bright and then, and yet, they feel like they they know all that they need to know or that they even sometimes know more than the other people in the room around them. And um, and that gets very grating. Um, you know, and I, we're a program that I think also tries to really respect wellness. But um, when when we start to get complaints about, you know, seminars starting before nine o'clock um, or things like that, those kinds of things um, <laughs> get um, get. Uh, a, a, those kinds of things get a little bit grating. And I think a willingness to meet families and patients where they are and, you know, willingness to kind of work and navigate the systems rather than, you know, coming in with their own perspectives or their ideas about the way things should be. And if the, the family or the patient is not doing it, then, you know, that's it and to wash their hands of it. So I think to really think about also the systemic and structural factors that may also come into play in working with families and how to support and, and navigate and advocate around, um, around that as well. I think it's also important in a in a good resident. And as as I was hearing them, something that came to mind for me was this idea of appreciative inquiry. You know, um, and so, you know, people who have that ability to think they're inquiring from but from like an appreciative like standpoint like oh wow like this is fascinating this is interesting this is not something I was aware of and just kind of like completely like commit to that process and they're present you know in whatever situation that they're in so this idea of like appreciative inquiry is one that I would if I'm proofreading any personal statements and I see appreciative inquiry in there, I'm gonna know where y'all got it from. Like that, 
Never heard that before. That was beautiful. I'm taking notes. I got intentional <laughs> curiosity and appreciative inquiry over here. I like it. I'm just saying, wow. All right. Um, last big question, because I think for all of us on the panel, this is big for us. So I don't want to limit it to one person. And then after that, I'm going to hit the rapid fires and kind of call you guys out. Um, I'm going to shorten this question, but just ask, outside of physically going to a program, how should applicants go about evaluating programs with respect to their missions, diversity, equity, and social justice? I know a lot of times it's check the website, but you know, no one puts on the website that, you know, this is not a place for you. So how should they really dig into that to figure that out? Um, any tips or tricks? Because this students, the HBCU grad, they want to make sure they go to the right place. I think they're going to have to actually like ooh, go to these open houses and actually go to the website, but not like, oh, we stand in solidarity. Look at their website. Like, what do the people look like on the website? What do the current residents look like? But don't look at my website because ours is we I have no control but actually look we have an Instagram which we actually control so um like look at the Instagram look at the um there's articles there's a program I won't name that had a pretty big article out about them earlier this year about their lack of um diversity and also a big one last year um so just see if there's anything like that um out there about that program but just have your eyes open and if you really do think you want to go to the program like try to participate in whatever virtual events they have i would say ask them like during your interview trail ask them and like specifically like oh what are you guys doing in this area or like how does this um how how does like diversity you know social equity like how does that like you know show up in the curriculum and like the patient and clinical experience and the didactics and um you know the opportunities that we have right and so i would ask them i agree i would ask faculty during the interviews to also see how how do they respond to these questions and so how are they also that may also give you a sense of how they may um how they may navigate and, and handle these situations when they do arise. Um, and then I think also talking, seeing if there are opportunities either with social events with some of the current residents or fellows. And I think finding out from people who are, um, you know, who are currently training and learning in those settings um, to see, I think is also helpful. All right. Thank you all. Uh, it's 6.50, so we're going to hit some rapid fires. I'm going to read one question, call on one panelist, and then continue that method. Um, because D.C. is a big state, I'm going to start with you, Dr. Harrison, or is it not a state, it's a district. <laughs> uh, so it's a big district. Um, for someone who's trying to relocate from a state that we can all assume they're talking about that is rolled back on LGBTQ plus population and DEI efforts, um, but they want to have them in their future practice. Is it as a is it appropriate to explicitly state that you want to leave that place for social justice reasons to come to another state? Yeah, I think that it's appropriate. And also, there's on your application now, you were asked. There's a way to indicate what um uh region you're interested in. So you can say like Northeast or Mid Atlantic. Um, they can write about it and they can also, also say why, like my family is here or something. So you could just say Florida and then we'll all know why or Texas and we'll know what's the reason. So I think, yes, it's fair to indicate that. Thank you. Dr. Strange, would you recommend explaining specific obstacles such as ADHD in personal statements or would you say be more broad? Just say I had difficulties. Um, yeah, that's, that's a really good question. And I've read a number of personal statements or, um, in which that has been specifically addressed. And so I think if it is also coming from a way of looking at obstacles or challenges and the way that you've been able to address and navigate them, I think that it can be really helpful to think about. And then, um, for me as a program director, I'm also thinking about, okay, and that's, I would say it's not a deal breaker or a red flag, but I can all, already be proactively thinking about, okay, how can we support um, you know, how can we support this, this potential resident or fellow in being successful? And, um, and I, and I have, and I have worked with 
you know, we've, I've had residents and fellows who have ADHD, who have had significant medical conditions, who have had, um, who've had to take medical leaves of absence in the, in the past for their mental health. And so um, I think it helps us just be prepared and think about how to be proactive in supporting someone. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ibueli, what experiences should re-applicants try to obtain in order to make them a better applicant the second time around? We know the SOAP happens, but that does not kill one's desire to be a psychiatrist. So how should they do better? I think if they can do rotations, especially in those programs that they're interested in, um, and I think that would help them kind of get in front of kind of like the herd of applications that we see, you know, um, the, if, I mean, you know, we can look at scores, we can look at, you know, personal statements and letters of recommendations, but if I have seen your rotation and I know that you're a hard worker and you have the attributes that and the characteristics of who, who I'm looking for in a resident, um, that for me would kind of like trump like any like failed boards or any anything of that because I can actually I've seen you, you know. Um, so I would say try to get a rotation in those programs that you're most interested in. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to come back around to you, Dr. Harrison. Not that I'm going to circle, but you mentioned this earlier. Um, how should someone who switched specialty interests, like a certain MS3 here, um, how should they highlight that they want to do psychiatry? Um, in what ways can they show that and not come off as someone who just switched? Put it in your personal statement. Like I, I have this interest because of whatever happened to trigger this change. So just put it in your personal statement so that it's clear. And then again, join these organizations, like do the psych sign, APA, Black Psychiatrists of America, um, the psych section of the SNMA, whatever it is, like show that you do have this interest by joining these organizations and seeing what groups they are in, seeing, following the, um, the list serves or whatever the activities are when people post about opportunities and actually say like, oh, I can do this. That's great. I'm going to go backwards because Dr. Strange kind of answered this a little bit. Um, so I'm going to go backwards and get another panelist input. Um, what philosophy or what's your philosophy on discussing personal or family psychiatric conditions in the personal statement or interview, specifically if it gives context to an academic or an exam related red flag, Dr. E. Boyle. So I think if it gives context to any potential red flag, whether it's like test scores or how your performance, I think it would be helpful. But I, I say that hesitantly because as much as I would love to say that, you know, psychiatry is progressive and it's more progressive than other fields of medicine, um, it's, um, you know, better than bad is not good, right? So, you know, so I would, I would hedge it. Then this is where I would make sure that you have different inputs who are reading your personal statements um, to make sure that you're putting your best foot forward. Like, I personally don't have a problem with, you know, people saying like, hey, I had anxiety and I have test anxiety. And so that's why I didn't perform as well or, you know, X, Y, and Z. But again, I want you to be successful beyond my program and just so I think it's it's the way that you phrase it and the way that you you put it forth. I am. Excellent. And I like this next question from Captain My Captain. Um, what are ways to magnify one's application, Dr. Strange, slash put it on your radar through a mentor or faculty member at your institution? And do you feel that's appropriate? Meaning if Dr. Harrison and you both worked in Vermont and she said, hey, here's Tony's application. He's great and slid it to you. Is that appropriate? Or is it just a coffee or a text like, hey, my guy's applying to your program. He's great. How do you look at those things and how can one go about them? I mean, I think, yeah, I think that, again, it might have us take a, a, another look or a closer look at, um, you know, if, especially there's someone who I know and someone says, you know, this person's really interested, they want to go there, that um, that I think that it is a, appropriate. You know, we try to be mindful about, um, yeah, a, around the, the equity piece of that, but I think definitely um, 
I think I, I would take a, another look at that application. Um, even with signaling, sometimes some candidates also will reach out directly to our program and just to say, you know, um, and it may help to do this earlier on in the interview process than once all the interview slots have filled up. Um, because sometimes in, you know, in doing it in a diplomatic and respectful way about, you know, hey, I'm, you know, I'm interested in your program. I just wanted to let you know. Um, and so those those can sometimes be effective too in having us go take another look um, if if we haven't already. Um, because the, the number of applications I get for fellowship is much more digestible and manageable than for our residency, which um, you know can be in the hundreds. So to be able to review all of those, um, reaching out and showing that particular interest can be helpful. All right, for these next two questions, all three of you guys, you can just raise your hand or put your hand down. Does your program see a difference between DOs and MDs? Up if yes, you can leave it down if no. There we go. And does your programs request that your DOs take step one and step two or is Comlex fine? Raise your hand if, if step one's needed. All right, there you go, DOs. You are safe at these three programs. Uh, this one is specifically for Dr. Harrison, obviously. If an applicant went to an HBCU, knowing that Howard got that HBCU filter, should they still signal Howard during this cycle? And if anyone else wants to jump in, feel free. But Dr. Harrison, obviously, this is number one for you. Signal question. I don't know, I don't know about these signaling yet. Um, but I would say, well, I'm going to look at your application, but there's going to be a lot of other HBCUs there. So um, because like I said, it's undergrad, it filters in. So it could be that you went to undergrad at Morehouse, undergrad at Howard, and then also the medical student. So yes, if you really want me to look at it, then yes, you should go ahead and use that signal. Um, unless you, I guess, know somebody who could tell me. But I will all just add to what Dr. Strange said. Like, sometimes a faculty member will say, like, oh, yeah, my so-and-so really wants to interview. And I'm like, it's January 30th. Like, I'm done my interviews. Like, what are you doing? Like, you should have said that a long time ago. So um, timing is important. I just wanted to add that, yeah. That's very important. Um, and I'm just going to assume for everybody else, yes, you need to signal. And for this attendee, um, every program stated that they're using signals as a reason to really look at your application, but no guaranteed interviews or anything like that, but it makes it shiny. Last but not least, right at seven o'clock for um, out of state medical students, I'm assuming they mean IMGs, without family ties to the state or region, how should they properly express a strong interest in attending your program? You know, since the word strong was in there, we're going to go with the strong the Ohio State. If you can let us know how someone should state that they want to come all the way from Guam to Ohio, what should they put there? Um, their personal statements um, would be very vital in that. And then also in their signaling um, would be vital in kind of letting us know why, why our program, especially from Guam all the way to the Ohio State University. It's a long road and a lot of different programs. So while we are the best, um, you know, just wanna know why, so. Excellent, thank you. All right, we're right at 701 and I respect all your time. And because I respect your time, I would like you guys to all go out with an outro the same way you came with the intro. Anything you want these students to know, um, any uh, reach outs that you want them to do social media wise or anything else, just parting words for our, I think at the max, I saw 35 attendees, which again is excellent for one of our sessions. We at 37 now and we were at 41. I just want to say that. Oh, like, it. Comes through. <laughs> like, it comes through. Okay. It comes through and that counts us as the four panelists, but you know what? We are people too. So yes, we were at 40 something at one point. Psych blew it out the water. I, I salute all of you guys, and please help get the patients boarding my ED out. I really need y'all. So just continue to do what you do. Um, but final outro, starting with Dr. Strange, parting words, and then we'll go around. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I'm trying to think. Um, I mean, I would just say, you know, take care of yourself through this process. Um, and it is really um, a, a marathon and, um, and, yeah, don't don't let it, don't let one um, 
experience or isn't um, affect your your worth or your sense of belonging in medicine because you do belong here um, and and you are desperately needed. So um, so I, I would just keep that in mind. Thank you. Dr. Harrison. Uh, I will say again that we're having an open house on September 18th <laughs> at 8 p.m. EST. And I just want to say, even though I am a millennial um, program director, I'm still a program director. So like, please don't DM me. <laughs> like, am I getting an interview? Y'all are laughing, but this is true things. Like, don't DM me asking me if I'm getting an interview. Don't email me like, hey, Danny. Um, Like, my name is Dr. Hairston. So um and use my Howard email if you somehow find my personal email like just go ahead and use my Howard email if you actually want me to pay attention to this but if you DM me I'm never answering just I just want to be um very clear I'm not gonna answer ever wow 2023 is different uh okay <laughs> final words Dr. Ebo Elliot thank you um yeah, it would be completely useless to DM me because I don't even know how to navigate Instagram or any of the social media. I just, I just, I don't. Um, I admire the people who have that ability and just it's not my skill set and I'm okay with that. Um, so you've made it this far. And so don't, don't give up. Um, I am a person of faith. And so like, you will be where you're meant to be, you know? Uh, so, um, you know, however you got here, yeah, it's, if it's your purpose, it's going to happen. So. Won't he do it? On that note, thank you all. Thank you again to our panelists for your time. Thank you to our attendees. You guys made this worthwhile. And as Brianna said, thank you all again so much for your time. To answer the question I know everyone usually has for me as a moderator afterwards, yes, this was recorded. Yes, this will be posted online. It will go to the Tour for Diversity YouTube page, um, and it'll be up as soon as I get it to our co-founder, Dr. Matthews, who uploads all of them. Um, but for now, y'all continue to kill ERAS season, and hopefully in March, we'll all be sitting around saying God did. Thank you all for your time, and have a great evening. For having us. <laughs>